on March 22, 2022, Justice Kentucky Jackson, an associate judge of the highest court of the most powerful nation on earth, was asked, where does life begin? And her response, I don't know. So in this video, we're going to try and answer that question, but not from our own understanding, but from the Bible's God's understand, God's definition of life. So just stick around for another 10 minutes till the end of this video, and I promise you, we're going to come up with something new. So before we get to the Bible, you might ask, King, what's important about knowing when life begins? You see, apparently, there's a huge number of people who rely on the information of when life begins to say, decide when to abort a baby. So, yeah, I think you see why it's important. We don't want people ignorantly committing murder in the name of abortion and going that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, if you end up agreeing with me, you can refer anyone with different opinions to this video. I'm basically doing the research work for you. So, question one, does life begin at birth? or in the womb. I think this is pretty obvious because the baby does literally kick the mother in case she was doubtful. But wait, does the Bible agree? I think it does because in Psalms 139, for example, David says to God, you formed my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. But wait, those are David's words. Even if they were out of revelation, it might not suffice for everyone. So what does God say about when life begins? Well, God's words are a bit peculiar because he not only assigns life from the womb, but he also assigns purpose from within the same womb. In the case of Samson, for example, God said to his parents that he would be dedicated to him as a Nazarite way before he was born, as a matter of fact, right from conception. And the same goes for people like John the Baptist, who God said would be anointed by the Holy Spirit from the womb. So the second question becomes, at what point during pregnancy does the Bible say life begins? Now, before you get to the Bible, there are a few myths I would like to dismantle. And while we are at it, feel free to comment whether you agree or disagree and point out the facts, anything. And also remember to like and share the video. Yeah, it will go along with helping me making content like this. Also, this is the first of what is most likely to be a three-part series where I talk about the church, Bible, and abortion. And so you might want to click on the notification bell so that you can be notified when the video comes out. Yeah. So now there are three main arguments stroke myths that are usually out there. And the first one is human life doesn't begin until the baby develops a brain or a mind. And they say that this is the proof of consciousness. And those who argue this point out also say that our intelligence is what separates us from other animals, which some of us don't have a problem killing. Now, I don't think that argument holds any water. And here's why. There's a huge difference between the absence of an organ due to the lack of it and an absence of an organ because it has not yet developed. And the difference is very obvious. It's, it's time and condition. If a living person has his brains taken out, he's dead. You can, nothing will happen to revive the guy again. But for a baby in the womb, give the baby time and that condition, that environment of being in the womb, and the brain will develop. So the lack of a brain in this case doesn't justify there not being any life. And again, physical development is something that occurs both inside and outside the womb. As a matter of fact, 90% of the brain grows between 0 to 5 years. 90%. So the lack of fully formed organs is not an indicator of the lack of life. It's just an indicator of lack of biological development, which will occur in a few weeks. And what's with this comparison between us and animals saying that, oh, uh, we are more intelligent than them and that is what makes us human and therefore can take out a baby in the womb because that's not technically human life because he or she doesn't have the intelligence that it requires to be human. Listen, our brain doesn't make us human. I'm sorry. It's a genetic code. As a matter of fact, it's actually there in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 1, where God says during creation, let animals come out in their own species and kinds. Like our genetic code, our species, that's what separates us from other animals. God said it in law that when two species intermingle or have intercourse, the product will not be viable. The offspring cannot reproduce. That's how biology works. That's what makes us human. It's not, it's not our brain. It's not our intelligence. And so if we use this argument, what about people in a vegetative state or people who are really old and cannot do things for themselves or human beings with conditions like the cerebral palsy? Do they not get to live because they are less human beings? I, I don't think so. The second point, argument, whatever it is, is that up to a certain point, the fetus in a womb is nothing more but a lump of cells. Now, I hate to break this to you, but you are a lump of cells. You, you did not cease to become a lump of cells 
the day you were born. No, it's so funny because basic biology says that cells are the basic units of life. Basically, if you could subdivide life, you'd have cells being the most basic unit. You know, there are single cell organisms that are regarded to be alive, you know, like paramecium, amoeba, germs, basically. They are, most of them are single cell organisms. As a, as a matter of fact, scientists will tell you that your red blood cells and your white blood cells are alive. But for this specific argument, all that logic is mysteriously thrown out the window when talking about human beings. Now, I know Human beings are not single cell organisms. So what point am I trying to make here? The point that I'm trying to make here is that life is at a cellular level. And every scientist, no, I'm not even joking, every scientist agrees that life begins at conception. So you might wonder what, what, what argument, what, what, what's the point of this video if every scientist agrees that human life, that life, not human life, that life begins at conception. Well, there's my third point. Many people argue, actually, some people argue that the life that begins at conception isn't actually human life, it's just cellular life. Um, like, up until to a certain point, what I may call ensoulment, like when our organism gains a soul, we are nothing more but some organism, some animal. We are alive, they agree on that, but just not human. We human intellect, a human organ. Just because it looks like this and not like this. Talk about judging a book by its cup. By its shape. This is worse than racism. It's shapeism. Plus size people should relate. <laughs> Got it! <laughs> but what does the Bible say about all this? Does it agree with science? Does it agree with the fact that life begins at conception? What does it say about human life and biological life? Let me just say this. What I'm about to tell you might blow your mind. So I'll quote two verses. The first verse is Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Where the Bible says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Now, this is obviously predetermined purpose, and it only proves the omniscience of God. And you're probably there saying, King, this does not prove anything. This does not prove life before conception. Life and purpose are two different things. They are two different... Okay, 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 okay. You got me. Okay, let us go to the second verse. That is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. And if there is any place where we can find the definition of life and where it begins, it has to be in the book of Genesis. And it reads, Then God said, this is verse 36, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and all over the earth, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. In verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, please listen carefully because here's where your mind gets blown a little. These three verses provide three very important concepts about the understanding of human life. First is identity, the second is blessing, and third is purpose. Now, the identity of man is very obvious. Man was created in the image and likeness of God. They were created both male and female. The purpose is also very clear because it's to rule and subdue the earth. Very clear. But the blessing part of it is often overlooked and misinterpreted or should I say underinterpreted because the blessing is the bridge in between the two the identity of man being created in God's image and likeness and man's purpose in subduing and ruling over the earth and this blessing applies to all humanity from the very early stages of the womb as a sign to the humanity and as an irrevocable command that has to be obeyed from a cellular level. And this blessing is increased and multiplied. From the time a human exists, he or she begins to fulfill this blessing. And this human life, from the biblical definition, begins at conception. Human life is precious. And while there might be many gray areas to address as far as abortion is concerned, the fact that human life begins at conception is not one of them. Let us not dehumanize these precious ones, all in an attempt 
invalidate their reason for living. It is a crime against yourself, it is a crime against humanity, and it is a crime against God. My name is Rekin Moenda, and this is The Kim Christian. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.